Today we're joined with Dr. Paul Camerata. He is a neurosurgeon. He is uh, teaches at the University of Kansas Hospital School of Medicine, and he's a specialist in cerebrovascular surgery. And today we're going to talk about St. Thomas Aquinas. And you may think, well, why are you talking about neurosurgery and Thomas Aquinas? And the answer is, is because St. Thomas Aquinas died of head trauma. And Dr. Paul Camerata, you probably know him from the St. Cast. He's produced how many is that, Dr. Camerata? How many episodes? Yeah, 145. 145 I think. episodes on the Saints. They're excellent. I've been re listening to them for years. And so he loves the Saints, but he also loves neurosurgery. And so he and I have been talking for a couple of years now on this idea that uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, in his final moments, died of a swelling of the brain. And he's going to share with us more information from his expertise. Um, he's written over 50-something articles on neurosurgery. He's a father. He's a knight of Malta, a dedicated Catholic, and a lover of St. Thomas Aquinas. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Camerata. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. It's great to be here. So how did you get interested in this topic? Uh, you originally reached out to me, and we started going back and forth on it, and there was some Latin texts that you wanted translated regarding the final days of Aquinas. And I looked at those and I found it fascinating that here's this dedicated Catholic neurosurgeon looking into the final evidence of the, maybe, in my opinion, the greatest brain ever in the Catholic Church right. happens I to mean, die through this tragic means. Just think of, of what we would have had had Aquinas had, you know, a normal life expectancy, another 20 years, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, to die at age 49. I think I, I first got interested in, I, th I think it may have been as I was uh, putting a podcast together on uh, Gregory X, who was the Pope at the time, and um, I uh, found out how Aquinas died. And um, at that point in time, we, um, you know, I started looking up things about his death and trying to look at all the extant literature that we had that described what happened, what happened during those last few uh, few days of his life, few months of his life, really, and trying to piece them all together. You know, it's always a little difficult uh, trying to do forensic pathology, which is what this is, you know, 800 years after the fact. So, um, uh, so I looked into it and uh, uh, found out the, you know, the mechanism of his injury and started researching. And you helped me generously with the Latin text so that we could try and uh, piece all this together. Excellent. For those that aren't familiar with the final days of St. Thomas Aquinas, I want to just look at the last year or so of his life, kind of the timeline of events. So, yeah, so uh, he was, it was about, uh, so he died in February, was it? Uh, he died uh, March 7th. March 7th, that's right. Okay, which, so is the, was... which is before Vatican II was his feast day. Um, it, it got moved after Vatican II, That's but right. March 7th, yeah. 1274 was the day. And sometime in 1273, so we're, we're mm -hmm. within a year or so of his death, um, the sacristan um, named Dominic of Caserta, he observed, said, Thomas Aquinas to be levitating in prayer with tears before an icon of Christ crucified. And either Thomas heard or the sacristan heard the, the famous quotes from Christ. Thomas, you have written well of me. What reward would you have for your labor? This is while Thomas is writing on the Eucharist and the Summa Theologiae. Mm -hmm. So he's, you know, the Summa Theologiae stops while he's writing on the Sacrament of Penance, but just before that he's, he's on the Eucharist. And Thomas, when he hears the question from our Lord, what would you, um, what reward would you have for your labor? Thomas Aquinas responds, nothing but you, O Lord, nothing but wow. you, O Lord. So already he's having this mystical experience talking directly with our Lord. Um, it's said also in his life that he was visited by our, our lady. These are kind of mystical things. Everybody thinks of Thomas Aquinas as this heady, intellectual, academic right. professor, but this guy is as mystical as you get. I mean, he's right there with St. Francis. Um, he had an apparition of our lady, and he was very worried that he would be elevated to the episcopate. And mm -hmm. he, he, like many clerics in the history of the church, felt that becoming a bishop would lead to damnation, right? And right. Uh, some of us in our time period right now wonder the same thing. Same thing. With all the yeah. corruption yeah. in the church. And Heavens. so Our Lady yeah. came and comforted him and said, Thomas, don't worry. I've 
spoken to my son and you won't become a bishop. And this is because Bonaventure was to become a bishop and those two guys were kind of parallel in their studies right. and in yeah. their lives. Um, and then also while he was writing his commentaries on Peter, on Paul's epistles and Peter's epistles, his, it was heard that he was talking to, to men in his cell and <laughs> this was suspect. And so the superior called him in and says, who's in your room at night? We hear you talking to people. And he wouldn't answer. And he said, under obedience, who are you talking to? And he says, I talk to Peter and Paul. They visit me and they explain the epistles to me. As I Wow. So he's a mystic. And so in this last year of his life, he's speaking with Christ. Not just Our Lady and the Apostles, but, yes. but Christ himself. And then December 6th, 1273, this is the Feast of St. Nicholas, um, while he's celebrating the Mass of St. Nicholas, his secretary, Reginald, says, you know, let's get back to writing. And Thomas says, I can write no more. All that I have written seems like straw. Straw. And I believe it was actually in a chapel called St. Nicholas, or a chapel dedicated to St. Nicholas as well in, in Napoli, Naples. Yes. And so on the, yeah, on the Feast of Nicholas, why do you think that is? I've always wondered, what's the special significance of Nicholas yeah. right there? You know, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know. So Nicholas, you know, was... Uh, his bones for a long time were in Bari, just on the other side of uh, the Italian peninsula, you know, not terribly far, probably a couple hour drive from Naples. Yeah. So, so, so maybe that's it. Perhaps I, that I, had something to do with I it. I know yeah. nothing of him having a devotion to St. Nicholas. Mm -mm. Um, I've never read anything like that. Um, you know, maybe it's the tradition of Nicholas being an anti Aryan theologian. Yeah. Um, Something, but anyway, it was the Feast of St. Nicholas. And some people, and I'd like for you to speak on this, because some people have said, well, clearly in this last <laughs> year of his life, he's having these mystical experiences. And, you know, if you're not a Catholic, if you're, if you're not a believer, this shows that there's some kind of neurological, you know, malfunction. Sure. Well, you, you know, know, all through history, people have... have um uh, have accused uh, mystics, uh, uh, people who have seen visions of having perhaps uh, an underlying brain issue. Maybe uh, there are certain lesions of the brain that can produce hallucinations that can make people hear things that, uh, that aren't there, see things that aren't there. Actually, they can be quite formed. I mean, I've had uh, patients tell me that you know, I saw somebody plain as day come into my room or they're standing right there talking to me. Yeah, I can describe what they're wearing. They can draw it, hear, hear their voice, uh, all of that. So, um, and these are people with actual organic, you know, lesions of the brain. Uh, there's a, another thing, you know, called epilepsy. And epilepsy is uh, a, a disease of people that have frequent seizures. Now, a seizure can uh, we usually think of a seizure as an apoplectic fit? Somebody is shaking part of the body, arms, legs, head, face, uh, but it can also trigger uh, parts of the brain that uh, bring up uh, either hallucinations or smells as a very frequent um, um, uh, epileptic uh, type of event. So these can these can all happen due to. Uh, structural brain lesions. Now, you know, whether you're going to actually have, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of hallucinations and uh, auditory uh, uh, things that Aquinas had, I think it'd be a, be a pretty far stretch to, to say, dating back over this, this last year, all of these uh, um, um, conversations that he's had are due to some organic brain lesion. Probably pretty doubtful. Yes, especially as we'll, we'll get to the end of the story, he didn't die of some sort of, of you know, congenital or, you know, pre-occurring brain issue. This was a sudden trauma that ends up getting him. Right. So yeah. it's not like there's lesions building up. I'm curious real quick, though. I don't know, and I'm sure most people don't know. What is, you've, you've seen brains. You work on brains. What does a lesion look like? We hear about this all the time, but what, what, yeah, so the, what are we looking so, at when we say a lesion? So the brain is a uh, is sort of a tan-shaped gelatinous structure. It's a really a structure full of full of nerves, millions and millions of nerves and blood vessels and uh, spinal fluid is inside of it as well. And it's uh, it has a certain substance to it. It um, is. Um, Frequently, now a lesion uh, is something that looks a little bit different than, than the normal brain, and that could be anything from a, a tumor, 
uh, which would look uh, perhaps discolored or feel a little bit different, be firmer, softer, etc. Um, or it could be a blood vessel malformation. There are um, uh, clusters of blood vessels that occur in the brain uh, that shouldn't be there. Uh, there is blood that shouldn't be there sometimes. And what we're going to postulate in Aquinas' case is that he had some blood on his brain that was sort of leaking over time. Um, uh, but when someone has a, a stroke or a hemorrhage, a part of the brain sometimes gets a big clot of blood within it. And anybody who's seen animals' blood, you know, it comes out liquefied within a few minutes. It's a solid sort of pudding-shaped thing. So when we look at the brain, we find inside of it an actual red or purplish blood clot that looks different than the surrounding brain. So a lesion is really anything that shouldn't be there uh, besides the brain, the normal neural tissue. Okay, so it, it could be a tumor, it could be damage, scarring, Blood, exactly. All kinds of things. Any, all of the above. Yeah, and that's term. what, and and anything that irritates uh, the brain could cause these sort of auditory or uh, visual hallucinations if they're in the right spot. It's just the brain works on electricity among other things, and something that disturbs that that electrical activity can can cause these uh, these sorts of events. You know, one of the things that you know not being, you know, epileptic or anything like that. But one of the things I've often wondered about Thomas Aquinas is, do you think that perhaps he had a very mild form of Asperger's? And the reason I ask yeah. this is he's, he's extremely intelligent. He seem when you read his biography, he seems to be um, socially um, uncomfortable. Awkward. Awkward. Yes. Yeah. And, and one yeah. of the, one of the episodes that comes to mind right now, just thinking about it is he's, when he's at the dinner table of the King of France and yeah. they're all having a conversation and he just eating his food and he slams the table and he says, that will refute the Manichaeans or something like that. Right. And something everyone like looks that, yeah. at him like, uh, what are you talking what? about? You know, he's just been <laughs> in his little world, his yes. intellectual world, just kind of cycling or stemming on this idea that's going to refute the Albigensians, probably, you know, that's what he, the Manichaeans. Right. the heresy, yeah. Yeah, and, and um, you know, the size of his body and sort of some of the details about him being a younger man and then mm -hmm. his temptation and just some of the some of the oddities in his life. Um, and then also this, this sort of phenomenal um, way of, of processing information and then, and then distributing it. So it's said that he would dictate six books at a time so you'd have six wow. secretaries and he would be you know he'd give five lines of the summa theologiae and then he'd do six lines of his commentary on aristotle's metaphysics and then he'd do 10 lines on his commentary on romans and you know and, and just and then when he got to the sixth one he'd go back to the first one so this is this intellect is not something that's normal <laughs> right even yeah. amongst the smartest people we see there is something about his brain that is special. So I don't know if maybe mild Asperger's is the right term, but could there be something going on there in his in the makeup of his brain? Well, yes. So, so nowadays, you're right. We might uh, refer to him as uh, mild Asperger's or something like that. We don't really, at least to my knowledge, know of any uh, structural changes in the brains of uh, people who have Asperger's syndrome. Uh, there's obviously something different about how they process information, but uh, if I were to open a skull and look at a, an Asperger's brain, it'll look the same as yours or mine or, or anyone else. Right. Good. I've, I've always wondered about that, and it's good to have an expert to ask, mm -hmm. ask it. So um, you had mentioned earlier you did a saint cast on Gregory X, who you told me before, yes. and it's a blessed. Yeah. And uh, blessed Gregory X, the Pope, asked Thomas Aquinas to go to the Second Council of Lyon, which is in France, and it was to be held May 1st, 1274. Um, the purpose was to reconcile the Greek Orthodox. Thomas Aquinas wrote a book called Against the Greeks, um, which was defending the Western understanding of things like the papacy, uh, purgatory, specifics, minutia on purgatory, um, indulgences, other, other such things. And this is what sets Thomas on a journey to mm -hmm. to France. Um, yes. So I don't know exactly when Thomas leaves, but I assume it's early in 1274. If he's got to get right. there May 1st, I guess, you, what, what do you need, like a month to make that trip? Yeah, I think it would make, it would actually be probably a couple of months. It depends upon how they're traveling. I think at least uh, it, by foot, and he was at least part of the time on a donkey. Yeah. 
It's interesting too. I, I discovered that in the 1200s, it was according to Dominican custom, you weren't supposed to use a donkey unless by a special really? huh. dispensation. Um, and that was wow. because the Albigensians went on foot and Dominic wanted them to be able to be more austere, equally austere as the Albigensians. So oh. I think, I'm guessing, unless he had a dispensation, he was probably walking all over Europe, you know, from Paris yeah. to, you know, back down to Bologna and Rome and he's walking. So everybody says he was fat and I bet he, you know, he maybe was a little overweight, but I don't think he was obese. Right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd, <laughs> uh, so I'd have to go back and look at the, the actual, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the Latin, uh, with you and see whether he was on a, on a donkey or walking himself. Yeah, it um, seems that he's on a donkey at the accident. Yeah, yeah. At the accident when it happened, you know, so he left at end of January, beginning of February, I think is when they, they set out, uh, for, for Lyon yes. and, um, and he is read, I think, uh, uh, in one of the, uh, the acts. So, so this is all in, uh, the acts of Thomas's canonization. And I guess, uh, your uh, viewers will know that uh, when someone, a saint, is canonized for about the last thousand years or so, there there's a process that they go through. And uh, in Thomas's case, uh, it started very soon after his death, and a number of people were called on to witness to his life of uh, heroic virtue and, and write down things. And so we took a lot of this from uh, his acts of canonization, which are, which are written in Latin, I think just a couple of years or so after he had died. And in there it says that he um, his I, I think in the testimony given by uh, what was it? Reginald right his uh, secretary is the one who talked about how he uh, didn't see he was deep in thought and saw this branch struck his head fell to the ground he was stunned people rushed to help him he was only slightly bruised apparently at the time and and uh, got up and uh, continued to walk on while chatting with. Uh, Reginald, who uh, tried to talk to him about the red hat that he was, you know, going to receive or that he, which of course he didn't want, but that everyone was postulating just like uh, uh, Bonaventure. Um, and, uh, and, you know, he went on for several more days and eventually he became uh, more and more sick. And that part is glossed over a little bit uh, in the, uh, in the acti, uh, the, um, they took a little bit of a detour. I imagine you, you at this time you could probably go and reconstruct somewhat the journey that he took from you know Naples to uh, I guess Fossanova is where he, right. he ended up uh, dying. And um, this uh, article that I was reading uh, mentioned that uh, it was probably at uh, uh, San Germano, which is uh, uh, today's casino, uh, that an envoy was waiting for him. And I told him to take a small detour. Um, uh, it says, uh, uh, I can't remember exactly where it was. but um, uh, And this was in Lent, of course. So he was, uh, uh, after a while, you know, fasting and yeah. doing the things that uh, and, happened at those times. And Thomas mentions in the Summa Theologiae what the standards for Lent are. A lot of people listening probably don't know how hardcore Lent was in the 1200s. But it was uh, no meat no dairy, no eggs from Ash Wednesday to Easter and no eating until 3 p.m. Because Thomas says that's the hour when Jesus died. So wow. what, no, what, they, call, what they call nones, yeah. you know, the ninth hour. And that's why we in English call noon 12 o'clock. Nones is really 3 o'clock, but the monks and the friars kept pushing up nones, 3 o'clock, closer mm -hmm. and closer to 12 o'clock so they could eat. So that's, why, eat, that's yeah. why we have the word noon. It's actually noon. the wrong word. Isn't that for, amazing? Yeah. So I, it's also interesting that the, the head trauma, the brain injury happens, according to Acts, near Monte Cassino. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that know your history of Thomas Aquinas, when he was a young man, his parents arranged for him to be the abbot of Monte Cassino, which it was right. the highest abbot. It's like the arch, arch abbot of all abbeys Order. yeah yeah so i mean it's 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 high and so his parents arranged for him to have this one of the highest posts in the entire catholic church and he rejected that in order to be a dominican which is this up-and-coming new religious fanatical new yeah. yeah movement that no one had ever heard of he was you know just 50 years old 
And so he rejects all that. So I think it is kind of interesting that, you know, he rejected Monte Cassino. And because of that, we have his writings, you know, yeah, we have his studies. Phenomenal. And yeah. it's just interesting, too, that the blow to the head happens in, happened the, in the location. Monte Cassino, Monte yeah. Cassino. So, you know, and, and then the acts describe again as he, you know, progresses towards his death in, in early March uh, that he becomes sick. He begins vomiting at times, uh, loses his appetite. Uh, there's a doctor who cares for him, uh, John of Guido from Piperno. Um, and he asked what he would like to eat. And he said some fresh herring. Uh, so they, they were actually able to no, I'm not sure that that would be what I would ask for if I'm uh, not able to eat or, or vomiting. But these are things that do happen to people who have a certain type of brain injury that we were that we're postulating this may be a um, something called a chronic subdural hematoma. And so uh, this um, this is something that happens when uh, you you the brain or the skull. I don't know. Is it a, Okay, to talk about it now. We could just describe. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, what, we're here. What might what might happen? So, um, and many of your viewers uh, may have had experience with this, or a relative who'd had some experience. It's a very very common thing to happen, especially uh, uh, you know to middle aged and, and older folks. And what happens is the skull. So when you um, when when uh, someone's skull hits a, an immovable object, so this is this is a 3D printed skull uh, that uh, we use in education. And, and Doctor, and, um, yeah. Since we're side by side, kind of hold it a little bit more in front of your face. Can you hold it to the side? We don't can't see it. So you'd like it right here? Yeah. Okay. Or a little bit higher. So, yeah. Okay. So this is a uh, this is a skull, and um, uh, when this so the brain inside the skull. Uh, has blood vessels that drain to the to the outside. So here's a smaller version. This might be easier easier to see. So another 3D printed skull with the brain and some vasculature inside, and the brain has these little ridges and sulcuses or sulci we call them on it, and there are there are veins that drain to the outside uh, covering of the brain. And what happens is when the head hits something that that is sudden the brain continues to move right it uh, there may be a yeah. few millimeters of space in there the head will hit but the brain kind of moves with it and in and in some occasions tears those small veins which leak a little bit of blood on the surface of the brain sometimes so little that even our imaging devices we have now cat scans mris can't can't see it just a little bit of blood uh, and if it leaks a lot of blood you end up you know passing out, going into a coma, going to the hospital, et cetera, um, and having it removed immediately. If it just leaks a little bit, uh, it, uh, the body tries to get rid of it, and in most cases it does, but in some cases, uh, older folks, folks that have a pretty significant trauma perhaps, uh, in some cases the, the hemorrhage that we call the small amount of blood uh, gets encapsulated and it tries to get rid of it, and over time, it actually sucks blood or sucks uh, fluid into it by osmosis. And we know this because we'll see somebody that has a, an injury to their, to their skull, uh, or it, it may even be something as uh, simple as a car accident where you're, we have whiplash. I have seen people, uh, you know, get a huge hematoma, chronic subdural hematoma, uh, by a very inno seemingly innocuous uh, so event. There's, there's In other no words, actual concussion pressure on anything it's just a correct yeah somebody slips and falls and hits their bottom on the sideway on or on the driveway on ice and it can shake the the head enough to tear one of these little veins mm. and in this case aquinas obviously wasn't knocked out he got right up or he may have been briefly knocked out but he got right back up and started walking right. after a short while so uh and then what happens is it builds up inside the head this little fluid these are blood vessels inside the brain here and it will uh it will push the brain gradually away from the inner table of the skull. The skull has a certain thickness to it. And as it grows, it pushes the brain, pro producing more and more pressure on the brain. And there's no place for the, for the brain to go. There's, it's a, the skull is a rigid, fixed, uh, fixed um, volume. And so that blood, nowadays, uh, when we see someone like this, the typical story is, oh, I fell on my driveway. I had one guy that had a deer a deer hit him in the head, put his antlers probably for uh, 
for something he did to his cousin or whatever. But the the deer put the antlers right into the right into the head, hit this gentleman in the head, didn't knock him out or anything. But about uh, six weeks, eight weeks later, he started having more and more symptoms: headache, nausea, vomiting. Eventually, from the pressure, he became nearly paralyzed on one side and uh, started vomiting, sick, etc. much like what we hear in the acts of, uh, of uh, sainthood for, for Thomas. And then what we do is we just drill a small hole. We don't make a large hole like this. In most cases, we just do a, a small hole, and that's enough to drain the Are we talking smaller than a, a pencil head or uh, a eraser? Probably about or? A, a dime or nickel-sized hole. All right. Yeah, we just drill that with a hole in the side, wherever it is, and uh, the fluid comes out, usually under a lot of pressure, and the people are immediately uh, cured, really. They essentially wake right up after surgery. Uh, most of the symptoms that they have go away, and, you know, if this truly is what happened to uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, he could have been cured by Everybody. a simple... Tree fine, How do you know hole. where to do the drill? You just look at the CAT scan and you can see the fluid. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, nowadays we look at a CAT scan. Back in the day, before I was trained, when there were no CAT scans, uh, we still knew about this, and they would put in exploratory. We call them burr holes because it's a burr drill that we use, but uh, they would put in exploratory burr holes. Someone would come in, you know, perhaps with a little weakness on their left side, so they'd think, okay, right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. We think there must be a hemorrhage here, and they would put them to sleep, put a couple of holes in, hope they found something. Yes. If not, they'd go to the other side, et cetera. So, and and how, how are they, I'm sorry for my ignorance, how are these holes uh, healed? Uh, so we, uh, if they're small enough, sometimes the, the bone will grow over top of the hole. Most of the time we don't close them or we put a small uh, piece of titanium on top of them to cover so they don't get a little indentation in their skin. But, uh, truthfully a small, you know, dime sized hole in the skull, uh, doesn't really do anybody harm. Sure. Sure. So if, if they had had the technology, but simple drill would have saved his life would have saved his life exactly yeah now do, how long do you think do, do we i can't remember the acts i don't remember any any amount of time in which it stated from the head injury to the death so the injury was uh let's see sometime i think in uh, Beginning of February, so uh, let's see. It doesn't really. Um, so he dies March seventh. In the so. day, then he died March seventh. So about six weeks or five weeks, perhaps. Right. Uh, at the outset, which certainly fits with the timeline of, of something like this. And it's interesting um, too that you know it it wasn't like you said brain direct brain damage. It was it must have been this pooling because we know also from the acts that while he was recovering, he was at a Cistercian Abbey at Fossanova. He was giving an oral commentary on the Song of Songs to the monks there. Right. So yeah. he's he's completely me mentally he's working right. And then do you see yes. that with the patients as well? You do. Yeah. I so mean, they some might have some will, paralysis, yeah. but they can still think and talk. And can still think and talk. It usually is a uh, is um, sort of a uh, gradual process for them to lose their consciousness is is usually what does it. Though uh, actually nowadays we see people before they get to that. We see them when they're vomiting and have a miserable headache, becoming a little weak. Some doctor will say, oh, this must be, uh, you know, something related to the head. They get a CAT scan, et cetera. But back, you know, and occasionally we'll see somebody who doesn't seek medical attention. And yes, it will be, uh, you know, they'll be lucid right up until the time that they can't wake up anymore. Right. Now, you and I talk about we got to do this great, you know, documentary where we go right. and oh, yeah. look at the bones of, of Thomas Aquinas. And you had said that if you were able to look at the interior of the skull of Aquinas, you would be able to make a diagnosis. How does that work? What would you be looking for in the cranium of Thomas Aquinas? Yeah, so that's a good uh, that's a good question. So, the um, first of all, we have to know that the bones of Aquinas are dispersed. I mean, or at least in two different locations. And um, there was a real interesting article written by Ralph McInerney. I'm not sure uh, most of your viewers. Uh, may have heard of him, a philosopher oh, yeah. from uh, Notre Dame for many years. He wrote a great article uh, in, in a journal called Christian History uh, a number of years ago about what happened to Aquinas' body after he was died, and, you know, a after he had died. And so, of course, the, you know, the 
he died in a Cistercian monastery, so the Cistercians wanted him, but he was, of course, Dominican. The Dominicans uh, wanted him. Uh, there was the issue of, you know, the relics and the appropriate resting place, etc. And it's a rather macabre uh, sort of uh, Yeah, I was going to say, uh, it sounds kind of like the battle over Fulton Sheen in New York City. Uh, it, very similar. I mean, right. it's like, it, was there anything like this in church history? You could, you could certainly point to this. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but as they were arguing, you know, and the Dominicans were obviously going to win out at some point. I mean, he is the, the master yeah. Dominican. And, uh, the, but the, the monks uh, at uh, Fossa Nova uh, disarticulated the head and boiled the the remains, uh, you know, so there would be no rotting or anything. And they, and the bones eventually got sent to uh, Toulouse, uh, which is where you can visit his relics uh, nowadays. But the skull remains at Fasanova. So, provided that the preparation uh, of the remains uh, was not uh, overly, you know, precise or or too bad, we could look inside the skull. And you would look for signs. Obviously, the brain would long be gone and all of the soft tissue. But with the help of a forensic pathologist, uh, you can learn a lot from looking at the skull. So you would be looking for a sign of, uh, of injury uh, to the skull, some, for, some form of, um, of uh, a divot. Uh, it doesn't have to be a fracture. It could be just a, you know, a, a, a line uh, somewhere. Uh, you could also look inside the skull. And you would see if you saw some staining of blood uh, along a, a certain uh, area. Um, there, uh, you know, there might be uh, remnants of uh, soft tissue along the inside of the skull. Again, I, I've seen photos of it uh, at Fasanova, but not the actual uh, actual skull. But I think uh, you know that there are uh, ways of uh, of looking at some of these bones after the fact, provided that uh, absolutely every hint of soft tissue hasn't been uh, disposed of. That'd be great. That'd be great to see, uh, wouldn't it? It sure would. Is that, That'd is be that on cool. Your bucket list. It is. Yeah. It's on my bucket list. I think I sent a letter off to the to the uh, uh, monks there at Fossa Nova a number of years ago. I have to follow follow up on that. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, so he died on March seventh, twelve seventy four, and uh, he received, of course, all the last rites. And his final words are recorded to be, "I receive the ransom of my soul." For love of thee have I studied and kept vigiled, toiled and preached and taught. And then he died. It seems like he died in mid-sentence. So yeah. I guess the swelling, um, you know, eventually just. And, and what would that to... death, would that be a, um, would he begin losing blood to the brain? What is the actual, actual mechanism yeah, so... of death for the, is it the subdural hema? Hematoma, yeah. Hematoma. yeah. So what happens is, you know, they're, they're. Uh, is only so much space inside the skull. And if that is occupied by an ever-increasing mass lesion, then the blood has to pump harder to get into the to get into the brain and keep the brain alive. So yes, he would have died a what's called a brain death, and that's because uh, uh, eventually the blood pressure rises uh, to the point that uh, it can't get into the skull anymore and you stop breathing because your breathing is controlled by your brain. Uh, nowadays, what we see is that you become unconscious usually before that happens. So you would become conscious and then in a matter of minutes to hours, uh, perhaps a day or two, uh, you would then s stop breathing. Of course, it could have been that he, that something had happened in the days prior, he may have aspirated, you know, because he's not breathing as well or swallowing as well, and uh, pneumonia may have uh, may have helped contribute. That's what a lot of people uh, with brain injuries die of. Hmm. You know, kind of the the meta question that I've often asked myself, I even asked the Lord, because it puzzles me, is, a, why would you allow your great saint Thomas Aquinas to die in this way? Yeah. And then B, Lord, I know you want all of us to be one. And we came so close to reconcile, reconciling the Eastern Church, the Eastern Orthodox with the Roman Catholic Church. You know, if you're going to bring your A team to that event, obviously Thomas Aquinas is your A team. Yeah. But you took him first. So maybe you can, if you have any thoughts on that, the you know, first question, why this death? And then B, why at that time? Boy, that's a good. Uh, yeah, that is a good question. You know, if you had the answers to uh, to something like that, um, you know, if we knew the will of God, it's uh, 
it's always so uh, you know so very so very difficult to to know the mind of, of the Lord and you know in this particular uh, council two were taken you know uh, to to uh, to great Saint Bonaventure uh, as well and um, and you know exactly I think uh, and those are you know, arguably the two I mean we think of the two greatest saints of the 1200s as Francis and Dominic right. But the greatest theologians are that duo, the Dominican yep. Francis, Saint Bonaventure, Dominican and Franciscan, yeah. And, uh, and the rumor Study is that together Bonaventure was poisoned, right? Yeah. At this council, it's not confirmed, but that's a whole other forensics, you know. Yeah, um, but that was one of Gregory's things. He wanted to bring the East and the West together, and you know, it's and yeah, how close have we come on the cusp? You know, uh, the Council of Florence, probably a couple hundred years later, maybe. But uh, other than that, this was it. You know. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, I guess, you know, the Lord has his own purposes and it just, you know, if I were our Lord, that's what I would have done, but he didn't do it that <laughs> yes. way. Why not? Yeah. You know, he, it's like, you're in the world series game seven bases loaded down by three and your sluggers up to yeah. bat and you say, no, I'm going to pull him and sub out yeah, that's somebody right. <laughs> else. And you think, what kind of a management idea is that in the world series? But that's how it happened, you know? And then yeah. I, I kind of also wonder, you know, so often, you know, in the Catholic tradition, we hear that accepting the death that God appoints for you is the sign of sanctity. You know, there's yes. been saint quotes, I can't remember, but if you resolve yourself to receive whatever death God appoints for you, that is a full temporal remission of your, of your sins. Right. You know, that that right there is the ultimate next to being martyrdom is the ultimate acceptance. And, you know, maybe for a guy like Thomas Aquinas, I, I hate to say that he had, you know, pri pride about his intellectual capacities, but it just mm -hmm. seems that that would be <clears throat> the most sacrificial offering, um, the offering of his intellect. Uh, uh, and it's not just an, an immediate, you know, destruction of the brain. It's a slow destruction of yeah. the brain. Yeah, just when you think about how things, the history, how history might have been changed because of that, you know, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Frequency, but uh, it's a it's a, a really intriguing film. You may want to might take a look at. Uh, I think Dennis Quaid was the star, and it was about 15 years ago or so. And uh, the plot line, it's a, not terribly religious, but the plot line is that uh, there is a um, um, a, uh, an occurrence of the aurora borealis, and it's allowing communication across decades. And uh, this young man, who is a uh, sort of a failed young guy, he's got an addiction problem. And uh, but his father died when he was young. His father was a firefighter, and uh, his father was a Mets fan. And uh, he, this young man, and his father were both ham radio operators. So he's getting on this ham radio, and he starts talking to somebody, and it becomes clear after a while that. The guy on the other end, you know, he started talking about the miracles, you know, the, the Mets of 69. And he goes, what do you mean the miracles? He goes, oh, yeah, it's, it's October 69. He goes, no, no, it's not. It's, it's, it's 1999. It's 30 years. And he realizes that he's talking to his dad somehow through. Oh. Uh, and, and he goes, Dad, you know, on uh, such and such a day, it was game whatever, five of the World Series. This is going to happen in the, in the ninth inning. He goes, are you kidding? That guy never hits a, you know, he can't hit anything. And he goes, but when you see that. He goes, you're going to you're going to go to a fire and die. But I want you to go the other way, go the way that you don't think is the right way. So sure as heck, he's sitting in the fire station. He sees this thing, you know, he says, oh, my gosh, maybe that was my my son. And all of a sudden the alarm goes off. And he goes to a fire and he goes he goes the way the way that he does that his instinct tells him not to go. And he lives. And then all of a sudden they flash back to the, you know, 30 years hence. And his son is, a you know, he's like a attorney and he, you know, he's no longer a you know, dirt bag and he's uh, you know, he's a, but then other things change, you know, like his mom is now in danger of getting killed because she's a nurse volunteering so-and-so. And so the whole future changes. You think, you know, there's gotta be a reason, you know, for uh, Aquinas dying at age 49, uh, you know, uh, yeah. it's in God's, God's mind. You know? yeah. And, and maybe, maybe Thomas Aquinas as an intercessor in heaven is stronger than him you know, explaining doctrine on the floor of a council. Yeah. I mean, that's just, yeah. that's just God's perspective and, and we don't understand it. We think that it will work better the other way, but you know, maybe that's the, yeah. the right case on it. So, um,
Well, thanks for all of that. Uh, it's, it's absolutely fascinating, and it definitely makes sense of all the facts that we have. That this freak accident where he hits his head on a stick or a log and gets up and seems to be fine and is talking for weeks and weeks and weeks and then has this sudden, you know, going deterioration, quiet, yeah, deterioration yeah. of the brain and, uh, and loses it all. So thanks so much for that. I, I also want to close. We had talked a little bit about Knights of Malta. I know you're a member of the Knights of Malta. Sure. And uh, you wrote a letter uh, to the Pope. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I and a number of uh, knights had gotten together. This was uh, over a year ago now. Uh, just an open letter to His Holiness, um, the Grand Master of the Order, Matthew Festing, uh, was asked to resign by by the Pope uh, at the instigation of uh, of some of the Pope's uh, um, associates. And so, you know, a number of us were were concerned. Uh, about the uh, uh, you know where the leadership of the order was going, and so we had written this letter. Um, Cardinal Burke also had been uh, you know uh, sort of unceremoniously demoted as the Cardinalis Patronus of the order. I know uh, Cardinal Burke through uh, an association I've had with him here uh, in the uh, archdiocese. We actually brought him in to speak to the Order of Malta and. I've uh, met him a, a couple of other times here in the Archdiocese with the uh, Catholic Medical Association, had a long time to discuss these matters with him. And so we were, we were concerned and, and, uh, and wrote this letter. And, uh, you know, uh, we're, um, we're still concerned. Uh, and obviously the, the order and the, well, the church, for that matter, is uh, undergoing great trials uh, right now. The Order of Malta is a, you know, it's a great order. It's been around for... Uh, over 900 years and uh, started as the, the Knights Hospitallers of uh, the Order of St. John of Jerusalem, of Rhodes, and of Malta. It's a really historical uh, entity um, with the charisms of defense of the faith, tuitio fide, and uh, uh, care of the poor. And uh, those two things— and care of the injured, uh, right? And care of the injured, yeah. yeah started doctors, as a yeah. hospital for uh, right. for um, uh, uh, injured pilgrims, you know, in Jerusalem, and um, so that had a particular uh, calling uh, to me as a physician, and um, so we uh, I became a member uh, several years ago. I, I think it's a it's a wonderful group, and they do a lot of good things. Uh, need to continue really to defend the faith, uh, especially in these uh, in these difficult times. Excellent. Well, thank you for that, and I um, encourage everybody to pray for that and pray for the Knights of Malta. Of course, pray for the church. I often talk about all the confusion and things going on in the church, so it's an honor both to have you talk about Thomas Aquinas, but also to, to, to be with you and, and hear about your own concern and uh, prayers and defense of the truth and, and uh, making those known to the Holy Father and to the, to the Knights of Malta at Broad. So thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Marshall. Yeah, and I... Uh... I appreciate being able to be here and talk about this. The saints are uh, are such a fantastic group of individuals. You know, as a as a doctor, I I, I have a number of favorite saints. I've done podcasts on a lot of them, and uh, but uh, I've got a big. Uh, I have the Holbein portrait of uh, Thomas More in my mm. office, and um, you know a number of uh, saintly physicians and uh, caregivers. And uh, I, th I would encourage, you know, all of your viewers, I'm sure to, uh, continually ask for their intercession and, uh, and look to their lives of heroic virtue. You know, basically if you have a, an issue that you haven't uh, beat or problem in a certain part of your life, there's a saint out there who had the same thing and was able to conquer it and, and, uh, live a life of heroic virtue. So. Yeah, absolutely. I, okay. I got one more question for you. Just came to yeah, mind. Yeah. It, it's, it has to do with medical saints. So, Perhaps okay. some of the greatest ones are Saints Cosmos and Damien. Oh, yeah. Twin yeah. brothers, physicians. First transplant. I was yeah. gonna, so I was going to ask you about that. So <laughs> exactly. uh, I did yeah. a podcast last week on them, and I mentioned, you know, if you look in the iconography, that they transplanted transplanted an African man's leg onto a European, man le European man's leg. Right. So you look in the image, there's a white guy on a table with a black leg. Isn't that right. amazing? Okay. Yeah, so, that's right. So, so that's the tradition. How much credit do you put into that story you think it's possible well, you never know i mean they're, they're the patron saints of transplant physicians you know the, but uh, and surgeons and mm -hmm. physicians at large so uh yeah i mean obviously this would this would have to be some sort of a miraculous right. uh you know uh, intercession or uh inter uh, 
uh, yeah, intercession here because, uh, you know, nowadays, whenever there's a transplant of one person to another, you have to give anti-rejection drugs, right. you know, now in that case, I really have a genetic would, uh, match here at all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. uh, but, uh, yeah, it, uh, you know, something like that would obviously have to have been beyond, uh, you know, unexplainable. Uh, in there, there's some great books on uh, on uh, medical miracles. There's actually a book, I can't remember the name of it, written by a Jewish hematologist from Canada. And she wrote a book where she examined the acts of the saints uh, that were open to her for the last, like, 200 years. And, uh, um, you know, talked about, you know, that uh, when when someone has a miracle that is, uh, and they're almost all medical miracles nowadays, um, you know, because these things are able to be examined. You can't really examine, well, I saw somebody levitate. Well, you know, we don't have any film, et cetera. So almost everything nowadays is is medical. And it's an interesting read of how, uh, uh, you know, people look at this and look, there there is no medical explanation for that. And you get a, you know, a... Um, a group of physicians to uh, comment on that and to and to sign uh, with the veracity that this is not explainable. You know, and there there is no explanation. I've I, I know some folks on the Congregation for Causes of Saints, and I've volunteered to be on that panel. But of course, they want impartial. <laughs> 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 <All right. laughs> Nobody with the That's skin awesome. in the game. You know, right. so I'll never be on it. But uh, yeah. you know. That's great. Well, uh, I encourage everybody to check out your your work on the saints. If you, if you like this episode, uh, check out Dr. Camerata's Saint Cast. My favorite one is the one you did on the Japanese martyrs. Oh, I've listened okay. to that one so many times and recommended. I, I weep yeah. tears when I listen to that one. It's very powerful. What's your favorite yeah. one? Oh, yeah, I think that's I think that's got to be my favorite as really? well. One, one, yeah. One, um, the, the other really cool story, uh, more of a storyline, not so much a, a sort of an... A, a, uh, a heroic saint story is the uh, the one on uh, the um, the chalice, the holy chalice of Valencia that is mm-hmm. felt to be the Holy Grail has the best uh, you know historical yes. evidence. And I interviewed a woman who wrote a book on it. And uh, Pope Benedict, of course, has said mass using the chalice as well as John Paul II. So I think uh, historically that's a cool one. But I I too like the the story of the Japanese martyrs and when they. You know the uh, the uh, hidden Christians sort of come out of the out of the uh, mountains and say they told us you would come. You know. Yes, it's amazing. Three years ago. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, Dr. Cameron, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Everybody, check out that Saint Cast, and uh, we'll see you in the next episodes. If you like these videos, please like and subscribe. God bless. Thanks for the great work you do. Thanks. Bye.